Hi, and welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, we're going to talk about the concept of a big umbrella. Big umbrella. If you enjoy what you get on this channel, uh, I invite you to support the channel, and the details to do so are in the description below. If you've been watching this channel, you know that the content you get here is not like the content that you get anywhere else, and it takes time, resources, planning, and uh, you know, space, that kind of thing, in order to make this, in order to make this channel, make this content possible. So that you can have it. So if you appreciate this content, you'd like to see it keep happening, I invite you to support the channel. The details are in the description below. So I want to talk about the big umbrella for for just a few minutes. Okay. The big umbrella concept. This is a picture of a, it's supposed to be the biggest umbrella in the world. China beat out India for the Guinness uh, <laughs> World Book of Records, Book of World Records for the largest umbrella ever. But the term big umbrella comes from the concept that the Southern Baptist Convention uh, allows Calvinism within it, okay? So I found this PDF over here on the left-hand side where in response to a question from the audience about whether Calvinism was compatible with the Baptist faith and message, Dr. Patterson noted that there is plenty of room under the umbrella for anyone who is anything from a one to a five-point Calvinist, okay? Um, I was not able to find this exact article on the Baptist Press News website, but I did search and I was able to find this one, which has a similar one. What is disturbing, however, is the recent tendency to grade one another on how a person lines up with a particular presentation of TULIP and make agreement, uh, make agreement a test of fellowship. Make agreement a test of fellowship. Well, uh, it's funny because any any church that has a statement of faith makes agreement a test of fellowship, and they like a Baptist church doesn't associate with a Methodist church because they simply draw the line at a certain at a different place. As Dr. Page Patterson rightly observed, there's plenty of room under the Southern Baptist umbrella for anyone who is anything from a one to a five point Calvinist. Okay, so you can look up these, and then this came from you can see where it came down here the original. Uh, article that decided from where that came is Patterson and Pressler caution Baptists against distractions from evangelism. And that concerns me. I mean, it's like evangelism. Bringing people in, keeping the institution going is more important than making sure that once they're in the institution, they are transforming correctly. So that is concerning there for a variety of reasons. So I do not agree with this statement for a variety of reasons. But I would also say that kicking... You know, if you could have a Southern Baptist Convention without Calvinists in it, that would not solve all the Southern Baptist Convention's problems. Having Calvinists in the Southern Baptist Convention is a symptom of its fragility in the first place. It's a symptom of its naivety and fragility in the first place, okay? And so the naivety and the fragility and the lack of discernment and the basic overall ignorance of basic Bible knowledge among the adherents of the Southern Baptist, those are some very serious issues that would need to be dealt with. And if you could actually deal with those, Calvinism would not be part of it. Okay. But there are two basic mindsets. And one mindset is that the Southern Baptist convention should be this overarching umbrella. And I know a lot of you listening here aren't Southern Baptist. I am not a Southern Baptist. I was ordained Southern Baptist in 2006 and I have been in and out of Southern Baptist, independent Baptist for a few years. And then I went down to nominational and now I'm completely rogue. I'm just a guy in a t-shirt in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, you know, broadcasting out of a closet somewhere. That's, that's all it is. That's all there is to it. <laughs> nothing big, nothing fancy going on here. But I'm familiar, I'm familiar with how this kind of stuff works. And so there's two mindsets. A big umbrella is like, you know, we should allow everybody in. And then um, there's, a, there's the smaller umbrella, I guess, is what you would call it mentality, to where we need to draw the line somewhere. And we should draw the line shy of Calvinism to where Calvinists, they're not trying to do what we're trying to do. And a lot of people confuse that because they think that by drawing the line of fellowship or ecclesiastical fellowship. Now, when I say ecclesiastical fellowship, it's like we're, we are or are not of the same church thing, okay? <laughs> uh, this is basically that. When you share a platform with somebody else, it can be very confusing. If you are in the same church, you're signed up for the same thing. One guy gets on the platform and says one thing. Another guy gets on the platform and says something else. Somebody who's trying to separate the signal from the noise and figure out what is right is going to be getting two different messages from the same organization. It's going to be very confusing to them. It's, it is 
in the best interest of anybody who is potentially listening to what the institution has to say, that the message is very clear and distinct, and that there is great plainness of speech, there's no equivocation, no, no, you know, soft speak to where, where it's not very clear, not coming across very clearly. We want to be fully disambiguated. There's no ambiguity with what we are trying to say. And the more crud you let into the assembly, and the more ambiguous your message becomes, especially to people listening. And you'd be surprised. When your message is crystal clear, a lot of people hear things you don't intend to say. Now, when your message is all jumbled, and you got several different conflicting messages coming from the same institution, imagine how much more jumbled it comes across in the hearing. Okay, so it's it does a disservice, it's pollution to the information ecology to not draw a clear line and make a clear statement that says, we are not that, we are not them, okay? Now, one of the arguments against this is when you try to draw that ecclesiastical separation line between somebody, you'll be accused of trying to, uh, you're, as if you're accusing the other people of not being saved, okay? And that's not what we're saying. We've got two different messages trying to do two different things. And that, that politically correct thing, like whenever you're having some kind of discussion or argument, that you know, doubting someone else's authenticity of conversion or salvation is off the table. You're not allowed to say that. And so what happens is the receiving end of the critique, they are going to weaponize that against you and try to say, oh, you're trying to say that we're not saved, we're not of the body too? I'm like, No, you're trying to do two different things. You believe different things than us. You're trying to accomplish something else than what we are trying to accomplish, which we will get to. I'm not a believer in a big umbrella. If, if you are a believer, I wish I, I wish I'd have thought of this before I started filming. But there's a picture of there's a meme I saw years ago of a guy. He has a small plant by his knee, and he's watering the plant, and the tree. It's going to turn into a tree. It's like an oak tree or something like that. And what is at the bottom of the picture is there is a noose tied around the guy's neck, coiled up on the ground and tied to one of these little small branches. It looks fine there. Looks fine there. But when that tree grows up, the tree that you're watering is going to hang you. So this big brotherly love, unity, false unity, satanic unity kind of thing that you're trying to promote, those of you who are big umbrella types, this this kind of thing is the tree that's going to hang you. There is a noose tied to that, and the, all the stuff that you believe is true is you you are defeating it yourself by supporting the big umbrella mentality. I'm trying to think what else I need to say while I'm on this slide. In Luke sixteen eight. Jesus says the Lord commanded commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children, listen to this. And this is what it... Huh. Worldly people are smarter than Christians when it comes to this stuff. They got this stuff figured out. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Did you get that? The children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. I'm going to show you an example of this. Okay, Talking about being children of light, there are other passages here that while ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. Ephesians 5, 8, 10, 5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. If you have the light, act like it. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So this walk as children of light, you have access to the light. And a lot of Southern Baptists have access to the light, but they don't walk in accordance with it. They're afraid. They, they're non-confrontational. And they, their values are mixed up and messed up. I'm going to give you an example of this. In Luke 16, 18. The children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. I came across... A Twitter feed, actually not on Twitter, but on a meme site. <laughs> and I have edited it because it has cuss words in it. I'm going to be honest with you, I really don't care about the cuss words. Um, but I have edited it out because of some people who have sensitivities to these kinds of things. So I have decreased the cuss words for your sake. Um, and we'll talk about profanity in a few minutes. But when the Bible says shun profane and vain babblings, it's not talking about cuss words, okay? 
is talking about the profane is that which disrupts the sacred. Okay. And I personally know people who are willing to split up marriages and commit adultery and will justify that, but then want to raise Holy Cain when they hear a TV show that's got a cuss word in it. Priorities all mixed up. Okay. <laughs> There's some of these Christian YouTube channels. Every once in a while, I hear people on there. The Christians are, are cussing, you know, I'll be honest with you. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care about that stuff. But for those of you who have sensitivities to this kind of thing, I have censored this for you. When I was a kid, <laughs> my mom used to try to record movies for us, like Hollywood movies, and she would actually pull out the audio cable where all the cuss words were and so that whenever we watched the recording later, it would not have the cuss words in it. Of course, all that did was make them salient. And then while she's going through the process of not recording the cuss words, you're hearing them over and over again as she rewinds and resets because she missed them or something like that. And to be honest with you, the part on Back to the Future where Doc is waiting for Marty to show up and he keeps cussing over and over again, she, <laughs> she would bleep out the cuss word but leave the empty space between it in there. It's funny. It's funny. It's funny what people go through. So anyway, yeah, I have a vid angel version of these little slides. So this guy says, I was at a crappy crust punk bar once getting an after work beer. One of those crap holes where the bartenders clearly hate you. So this guy's at a bar at a, at a hole in the wall kind of bar where the bartenders clearly hate you. So the bartender and I were ignoring one another. When someone sits next to me and he immediately, and the he there is the bartender, he immediately says, no, get out. Tells him to get out. Next scene. And the dude next to me says, hey, I'm not doing anything. I'm a paying customer. And the bartender reaches under the counter for a bat or something and says, get out now. And the dude leaves kind of yelling. And he was dressed in a punk uniform, I noticed. Anyway, and this is somebody else's story, not mine. Anyway, I asked what that was about, and the bartender was like, you didn't see his vest, but it was all Nazi stuff, iron crosses and stuff. You get to recognize them. And I was like, oh, okay. He continues. You have to nip it in the bud immediately. These guys come in, and it's always a nice, polite one. And you serve them because you don't want to cause a scene. And when they become a regular, and then they become a regular, and after a while they bring a friend, and that dude is cool too. And then they bring friends, and the friends bring friends, and they stop being cool, and then you realize, oh crap, this is a Nazi bar now. And it's too late because they're entrenched. And if you try to kick them out, they cause a problem, so you have to shut them down. Where do you shut them down? At the first one. And I was like, oh darn. And he said, yeah. You have to ignore their reasonable arguments because their end goal is to be terrible, awful people. And then he, um, then he went back to ignoring me. But I haven't forgotten that at all. Now, when I compare, immediately I saw the connection. I saw the parallel here between letting Calvinists into your church. I am not trying to compare Calvinists to Nazis. Okay, that's not what I'm trying to do here. So don't twist this out of context. What I am doing is I'm showing that a bartender at a bar is smarter, is smarter than Southern Baptist church leadership about being very clear about who should and who should not be there. And if you don't want the venue to turn into a certain kind of place, you have to nip it in the bud early. And you have to be decisive and forceful. You can't be nice, kind, and gentle about it. You can't wait till it becomes a problem. You have to do it early. You have to have your radar up. So if we go back and look at this again... Um, you didn't see his vest. It was all, say, Calvinist stuff. He had a, a beard and a hipster hat and glasses and a plaid shirt. <laughs> you get to recognize him. He was saying things like doctrines of grace and sovereign grace and all kinds of other nonsense and you'll never, tulip and stuff you never find in scripture. 
you get to know how they talk. You see, you can you can spot. It's like these Calvinist plants that will come, like one one of them will come into a Southern ba- or a Southern Baptist Sunday School classroom, and they'll be chiming in just like everybody else. But you can kind of hear their language is a little different than everybody else's. They're using language that you would use, but it sounds a little different. You're not quite sure what it is. Kind of sounds like us. It's not quite like us. So what's he say? You have to nip it in the bud immediately. These come in. They're always nice, polite. When I get that all the time, I deal with stealth Calvinism all the time. I was just talking to a church. Every single time I've dealt with this. These stealth Calvinists come in. You know what the people say? They're myopic. They're only thinking about their situation. And they're thinking, but the pastor is such a nice guy. And we love him. And he gave a car to our teenage son when we couldn't afford one. I mean, all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of great, wonderful things about these people. They're there to destroy your church and turn it into something that is not a church. They're great, wonderful people. I get it. It is not easy. It's not easy to be the enforcer, to be the curator, the custodian of pursuing what is right when the person that you have to stand up against is this nice, kind, sweet, God-fearing, wonderful you know, godly, dedicated person. Of course they are. Of course they are. In the same way, and you serve them because you don't want to cause a scene. So you let them in their church because you don't want to cause an issue. And then they become a regular, and after a while they bring a friend. That dude is cool too. And then the, that's, the Calvinist infiltration happens this way too. So it can happen from the top down. It can happen from the bottom up. And this happens a lot. Or you'll get a Calvinist who will get on the pulpit committee, And they are actively searching for a Calvinist pastor where none of them else really are. And they go through the vetting process and they they have an agenda which no one else knows they have. So when they are saying, I'm not so sure about this guy, I like this other guy better. There's a reason behind them saying that, that they're not telling everybody else. They will infiltrate. So it's too late because they're entrenched and if you kick them out, they cause a problem. And, and most of the time, all those ones that I hear about, by the time the members learn the problem that Calvinism is, that it, it's, a, it's a serious problem in the, at that point. And, th- and that's usually the case. One or two usually doesn't hurt too many things. It's just like, you know, there's these statistics on Muslim infiltration that Chuck Missler used to cover on when Muslims would come into other countries. There's certain percentages of the population that they are nice, kind, sweet, peace-loving people until they get to a certain place where they try to actually change the way the government is run, they try to, you know, and then they start becoming more violent, things like that. And so these guys have an agenda. When a Calvinist comes into your church, here's the problem. They have a very specific agenda to convert people to their way of thinking. And it is asymmetrical because they are... They are committed to it, and they are more prepared to convert people to their ideology. And what is the absence of Calvinism? It's just baseline Christianity. Who's trying to convert anybody to that? Everybody's already that, ostensibly. So nobody's trying to convert anybody. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of like the DSM-5 doesn't uh, have a description of what well-being looks like. It's got a description of all the problems, but it doesn't tell you what well-being looks like. There is no agenda to be on if you're not a Calvinist. But the Calvinists are on an agenda nobody else is. So it's not a symmetric thing where people by default are fighting, are recognizing it and fighting against it. Okay? And that needs to change. There needs to be a specific focus on making sure this does not come in, does not infiltrate. They're entrenched and you kick them out to cause a problem. By the time it's spread to two or three people, then you start trying to do something about it or two or three families, that kind of thing. Then pretty soon you have a church split. And this, uh, and then they have to ignore their reasonable arguments, just like Calvinists. They got great arguments. You know, Calvinism is a, a collection of clever post uh, cle- clever a collection of clever philosophical reasons for why the Scripture isn't true. That's what Calvinism is. The only difference between Calvinism and atheism is that Calvinists are professing to believe the Bible while coming up with clever arguments for why it's not true. Atheists are not professing to believe the Bible while coming up with clever arguments for why it's not true. That's why Calvinists, early on, during their cage stage, they have to learn to be very tricky. They have to learn to double speak. They have to learn how to evade questions and how to twist things around and how to equivocate. They have to learn all that stuff early on because they are trying, they are, their whole system is basically clever philosophical reasons for why scripture isn't true 
while professing to believe it's true. And that's, it's two contradictory things. That's why everything is so avoidant and so clandestine and so, it's so icky. It's just icky. Everything about it is icky. So these guys, these guys, this bartender is uh, wiser than the children of light. He's wiser than Southern Baptists. This bartender is wiser about his bar getting infiltrated than church leadership is about what's going on with their churches. He's better about curating and being a custodian of that bar. He's better about curating the clientele there than churches are their own clientele. And this is stupid. This should not be the case. So we have a problem with people being naive. They're very naive about what's going on in the the malicious motives that people have. Some of the Southern Baptists, they value being perceived as nice over and above their custodial role and responsibility both to the body and to the information ecology in which the body interacts with itself. What are you trying to say, Kevin? If you're in a church, you need to help maintain that church body. And if something threatens it, you need to take responsibility to do something about it. You can't just let it go. You can't. We are way past the time... We don't have, we cannot afford those kinds of Christians anymore. We need Christians who are willing to do something about it. Be a custodian of the body. And of the information ecology with which the body interacts, you need to be a custodian of that too. And don't let people introduce pollution into the information ecology, which is what any any ideologically possessed person will do. So these people who, uh, big umbrella types... They're naive. They value being perceived as nice over and above their custodial role and responsibility to the body and to the information ecology in which the body interacts with itself. And these big umbrella types succumb to politically correct lingo, which serves as the inroad to the infiltrator. See, when I say, when I would say something like, this is a matter of ecclesiastical separation. If you are going to profess, believe, and promote this, you need to do it somewhere else, not here. That'll get twisted around as if I'm saying that they're not saved. And that's the big no-no. That's like the big, that's like racism or something like that. That's the big thing you can't do. It's a big thing you can't say, okay? And really, when it comes to claiming people aren't saved, the real motive behind that is that you don't just want to use that as an argument tactic when you think somebody doesn't agree with you. you know. And, and there's different levels of that. Like, well, if you were really saved, you would know. Or... When God opens your eyes to this, you'll understand. I've got people tell me stuff like that about Calvinism, about the gap theory, all kinds of stuff. I mean, it, the, the subject, the substance isn't there. And so they have to resort to some kind of Gnostic eye-opening influence that magically happens to you for you to see something that the evidence doesn't support. Okay? And then they fail to see the consequences of inaction. They... Modern church members have absolutely, they have no sagacity. They have no foresight. They, they do not see that they are watering the tree that's going to grow and they have the, the noose tied around their own neck. It's going to grow big and hang them. They don't see that. Okay? And that's a problem. When these guys come in, when the wolves come in to take over, Paul describes them. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Okay? Don't put them under a big umbrella and all get along. Mark them and avoid them. Very clear. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. That's very clear. But their own belly. And by. Look at that. But he's such a good guy. But he's so well spoken. Good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the sinful. Look, the deceivers are nice guys. They say nice things. They sound good. It's so hard to get that across to people. I mean, you think you think the wolves are going to come on, you know, speaking all. They're not easy to spot. Whatever it is that you think of as a good, godly, dedicated Christian, that's how they present themselves. Even the devil transforms his ministers into the angels of light, okay? What do you think they're going to look like? You think they're going to come out cussing and say all kinds of horrible things and wearing a tank top to church? I mean, who knows? I don't know what you think a deceiver is going to look like, but we're told very clearly that good words 
and fair speeches. He's such a nice guy. He's such a good guy. He's such a godly, dedicated Christian. Of course he is. Of course he is. But but look at what they're committed to. It's very clear. You cannot be distracted by non-epistemic ranking criteria. The fact that he is a good guy does not mean that preaching falsehood is okay. Does not mean that having falsehood under your umbrella is okay. Get rid of it. And if you have to get rid of him to get rid of it, and by the way, when it comes to leadership, you cannot have a leader, I, I say this in other videos, but you can't have a leader come out of Calvinism and then keep leading, okay? It takes, I would say, at least five years to unlearn the Calvinist, to take to fully remove the Calvinist lenses. And they're probably not even fully removed after that amount of time. But it takes a lot of hard work and a good amount of time to, to get the Calvinist lenses, the systemic poison out of the bloodstream. Because Calvinism is not just this peripheral thing. It affects the way they see everything. It affects the whole, all scripture, every verse of it. It affects all of it, okay? So you can't just go from being a Calvinist. You can't just renounce it and then keep being a pastor. No, you need to, you need to go unlearn some things and then relearn some things. You, the mindset is still messed up. They're still thinking propositional alignment with propositional truth claims and getting people to affirm them is the goal of Christianity. They still think that, even though they're not a Calvinist anymore, they still have that problem. So there's, there's a lot of things that need to be corrected before they're ready to lead again, for sure. So if they are a Calvinist, or if they have recently been a Calvinist, you don't want them leading at all. Not a chance. So when we say we have ecclesiastical fellowship break, we're gonna, not going to keep them in the big umbrella. It's not that someone is or is not saved. That's not what we're trying to say. That's not the basis of disfellowship. The issue is that people are differently oriented and they're trying to do two completely different things. In other words, what the church should be doing is trying to edify people. And that is a for genuine transformation. When I was candidating to be pastors of churches on my resume, I would list the, the three priorities of a church. And that is number one, to please Jesus Christ. In other words, you need to do what Christ wants you to do, even if it doesn't make sense to you. Um, obedience kind of thing. Number two, edify the saints. Number three, evangelize. A lot of people have that backwards. They think evangelism is the number one goal of the church, and that is one of the first ways to destroy a church. Okay. Um, so evangelism is a natural byproduct of transformative edification. Okay. It will happen naturally and you won't even have to try to do it. You won't even have to train to do it. Okay. If you have genuine transformation going on. So edification of the saints is way more important than, than, uh, than evangelism. And that's one of the questions you want to ask yourself when you're dealing with a church crisis issue is what are our, what are our goals? What are we trying to accomplish as a church? And if you can't nail it down like that, mm, you're not in a good place to make any decisions because you don't know what you value. Calvinism, it, their measure of success. So if I'm in a church, my measure of success is the genuine transformation of the people who are coming to the church. Genuine transformation, not alignment with an ideology, not agreement with me, but genuine transformation into a wiser person who now has the capacity for discernment, uh, et cetera, and so forth. Genuine transformation. A Calvinist's measure, what they are trying to accomplish in church, is to get everybody to align with an ideology. It's just head knowledge. It's a bunch of propositions, doctrines that you have to think are true. All right? And that is fake edification. That is not real edification. That's what you call simulated thinking. That's, that's getting people to be programmed with a formula. It is brainwashing. It is not genuine transformation. They can't do any real thinking on their own. They can't do any sense making on their own. All they're doing is learning a system. And that is replacing the concept of edification and discipleship is alignment with this system. Willful affirmation of creedal propositions that are in alignment with the systematic theology that Calvinism approves of. And that is what substitutes for edification, not genuine transformation. So a Calvinist is trying to do something. Their concept of what should be going on in church is completely different from the Ephesians 4 model of what edification should look like, okay? And so they're completely trying to do two separate things that have absolutely nothing to do with each other. 
So you cannot be under the same umbrella if you have different goals and you're oriented in different directions. The sacred orients you. And if you are properly attuned to the sacred, you can be properly oriented. If you are not, if, if you have the wrong idea of what is sacred, if Brother Melms, if Charles Spurgeon and Grudem's systematic theology are more sacred to you than the Bible, and I know you won't claim that, Calvinist, but they are, you are disoriented. You are not oriented correctly. And then everything you say is profane because it disrupts proper orientation. And then when the spirit motivates movement, it's in the wrong direction, you see? So you need to have proper orientation. If you have a Calvinist in your church, they are not properly oriented. And I would, I would say that 95% of non-Calvinists are also improperly oriented for a variety of other reasons. But for sure, Calvinism, by definition, cannot be. A Calvinist cannot be properly oriented. It's impossible. You cannot be ideologically possessed and properly oriented. So that's, that's another reason you cannot have somebody who's ideo ideologically possessed, any ideology, as part of the local assembly because they're trying to do something else. Now, the Bible says, study to show thyself approved. Paul tells Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings. Now, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker. Well, we would say cancer today, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, and he goes on to uh, explain some of that. Now, profanity, when you see the word profane, you're probably thinking of cuss words. Profanity is not cuss words. Profanity, th that's a, those are vulgarities, okay? And maybe vulgarities are a bad idea, but that is not what the Bible is talking about when it says profane babblings. When the Bible talks about profane babblings, it is that which disrupts the sacred. That which, uh, things that are disruptive to the sacred are profane. And that in other words, and what does the sacred do? The sacred orients you. Okay? And so that which is profane disorients you. So preaching that causes you to lose your vision of what the prop, Paul said, I'm pressing toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. False preaching will cause you to lose sight of Christ as your mark your sacred second self, the person that you should be becoming. You will lose sight of that and you will become disoriented. You will become reoriented, reoriented towards something that you should not be becoming. And that is profane. Okay? Utterances. Uh, profane and vain babblings that cause you to be disoriented. That is what is profane. Things that, things that generate ideological possession in people or methodological possession in people. Uh, is that's profane things that cause people to be um you know thinking of the four kinds of knowing perspectively narrow that is profane the inability to consider other points of view and not just opposing points of view but supplemental points of view that help you you know just somebody somebody doing a recon from the other side of the mountain you need to be per perspectively broad and something that steers you away from that by doing this us-them thing and all that stuff. It's profane. It's all profane. That which is sacred has the capacity to properly orient a person toward the mark toward which they should be pressing. And anything that disrupts you from that orientation is profane. So profane and vain babbling is not people cussing. It's people telling you things that are false edification that result in ideological possession rather than genuine transformation and growth say who who do we need to watch out for who's doing this profane vain babblings and how to, and so it's not just calvinists that you need to watch out for in the big umbrella um so any kind of ideological possession anyone who has certainty and that's a buzzword there because people crave certainty they crave certainty and uncertainty is very uncomfortable for them and they can't get that Uncertainty is where wisdom is. That's the wisdom gem. That's where you grow. And people crave certainty so much they never spend any time in uncertainty and they therefore have no wisdom. Somebody asked me a question recently about James 2.24. And he wanted answers, 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 answers. And then somebody else came on and commented under that video, said, see, this is why we should have statements of faith because you got to be able to give people answers. No, 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 no. The, <laughs> 
if I was oriented, if I was disoriented like the Calvinist is, it would all be about answers, the power to explain. Okay? That's, that's how systems are measured. Systems of approach are measured. No. The power to transform is what I'm aimed for. And being able to give you certainly a quick answer is not going to help you transform. And the answer is not what you need. And you don't get that. People don't get that. Your goal is not to have <laughs> excessive certainty about propositional truth claims that you can't verify. The proper orientation is toward genuine transformation. And so rather than answer somebody's question, it's better for them if somehow some kind of epistemic or wisdom capacity is generated in them and that the question is used as a, an opportunity to do that, is used as an opportunity to afford that. So it's not about getting an answer to the question. It's an opportunity for, it's an opportunity to wrestle with your uncertainty and wrestle with your capacity to deal with your uncertainty and with your epistemic capacity and with your methodological procedural knowledge of the inductive method and basic wisdom and perspectival awareness. There's all kinds of things that go into it that need to be cultivated rather than just giving somebody an answer. That's what, that's what you don't get. You don't get that. You would be doing people a better favor if you would disabuse them of all the things they think are true rather than teach them things you think are true. That would be the better way. Anyone who has certainty of an elaborate systematic theology and is working toward orienting other people to affirm or submit to their paradigm is disruptive of the sacred. Whether it's Calvinism or Calvinist, that's all they're trying to do. They're trying to, they're trying to get people oriented toward willfully affirming that their systematic theology is true. That's their goal, and that is their measure of edification. They think people are edified when they do that. That's not edification. So anybody who's doing that, regardless of what the system is, that goal is, we don't want them in the umbrella. No, we don't. Does that mean that we don't want them at all? We don't want them to be saved? No, that's not what we're saying. They're not ready yet. We need to make sure the people in the umbrella are non-fragile so that we can incorporate people like this and we're strong enough to help them, which... There isn't a church model that I know of. I don't know anybody who's doing the Ephesians 4.16 church model that's strong enough to help anybody right now. Their words, if somebody's like this, their words are profane and vain babblings and should be shunned. So you can't sit back and be Mr. Nice Guy and not do anything about it. You have a curative and a custodial role in the body of Christ and you need to take responsibility for it, Christian. No matter who you are, do something about it. Do something about it. Take the responsibility Take the cost that comes with that responsibility and do something about it. These kinds of people who have certainty of an elaborate systematic theology are not qualified or capable to participate in the Ephesians 4.16 edification model. They would need to have a genuine metanoia experience before they could be of any value to the growth process. Metanoia, that's the Greek word that gets translated to repentance. And the, really the closest English word today would be metacognition. If you think of all the different paradigms of thought that people are in, the idea is that you are beyond them. You are above them and you have cognition that is not entrapped by any particular paradigm, but you can be metaparadigmatic, metacognition. So what a Calvinist needs before they can be edified is they need repentance. They need metanoia. They need metacognition. They need to escape. They need to be set free of, delivered from the captivity of their ideological possession, of their paradigm. They need to be delivered from that. And your interaction with a Calvinist or anybody who's ideologically possessed should be to do whatever you can, not to convince them of whatever propositional truth claims you think are true, but to simply um, do what you can as skillfully as you can, as wise as you can, to in, disabuse them of their ideological possession. You say, well, didn't Jesus say, you know, while the wheat and the tares are growing together, that you should just let them both grow together till the harvest? Doesn't that mean we should let them all stay in the church? Jesus was talking about the kingdom of heaven. He was not talking about a local church. 
when it comes to the local church and you have people that are disorderly, disruptive of the sacred. And now this is not the only verse. I could give you multiple passages, but this should suffice. Let me make this a little bigger in case it's difficultatious to see. Your glorying is not good, Paul tells the Corinthians when they got somebody being um, disorderly in their service, in their church. They're committing fornication. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ is our, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Which, by the way, Calvinism is so rivalrous that that's all it breeds is narcissism, malice, and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Calvinists might even have sincerity, but they don't have any truth. Okay, the, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is not just uh, true propositional statements. It is alignment with the way that is Christ. That kind of truth. Now, here's what a Calvinist will do. Once, a, once Calvinism gets to the point where they can take over your church. Here's what they're going to do. I've been looking at this nine marks thing stuff lately. Um, I'm aware of it, been aware of it for years. I know that it's Calvinistic, but I never really delved into it. And so this recent church that I came across, their pastors promoting the nine marks stuff as the vehicle through which they're transforming, you know, the church into a Calvinist church. So let me tell you what they're going to do. Mr. Big Umbrella Non-Calvinist Person. You are like, oh, there's a room in the umbrella for all of us. We should all be able to get along under the same umbrella, the same denomination, the same church. That's not how they play. And you need to know that. The main system that's active right now of converting churches to Calvinist churches is the Nine Marks system. And Nine Marks is bad for so many reasons. Even... Even if all the marks were good, which they're not, even if they were good, it violates Goodhart's law because as soon as you identify certain virtues as a metric of, of improvement or virtue of, of well-being, they break down as a good measure. So even if they were good, as soon as you isolate them and decontextualize them, they, they lose their value. So that, that'd be a problem to begin with, even if they were good, but... These two that I want to point out in by, uh, the biblical theology and biblical church discipline. Now, this word biblical really means nothing because a Jehovah's Witness is going to say biblical such and such too. And of course, what they say is going to be a lot different. So it, it's just, it's pretentious for this guy, Mark Dever, I don't know how to pronounce it, Dever, Dever, to say a biblical understanding of this, a biblical understanding of this, a biblical theology, you know, Give me a break, man. So let's break it down. What are they going to do? Are they big umbrella people? No. No. You bet your patootie they are not. In the original Nine Marks letter, he says, the second quality I would hope you require, ho huh, hope you to require in anyone whom you would call to the eldership, would that, would that be he be sound in his... <laughs> would be that he be sound in his full theological system. Now look what he says very clearly. And that means being what some what has come to be called reformed. And then he goes on this long spiel about, you know, sovereignty and God being in control, all this kind of stuff. So when he says biblical theology, what he means is Calvinism. That's what he means. And the church, the one of the marks of a healthy church Biblical theology sounds good, but that is a Trojan horse statement. And what he means by that is Calvinism is one of the marks of a healthy church. If you want a healthy church, you've got to have Calvinism. Well, what's that marked with? Now, these numbers don't align. I got seven over here in the table of contents. And over here, it says the eighth issue because this is the third edition. And the numbers, I think, changed around between the original letter that he wrote and by the time the third edition got written. So I know that seven and eight do not match. I know that. But that's what it says. So I'm just cutting and pasting what it says. And then there's a fourth edition coming out. It's not released yet, as far as I know. Um, that should be available soon. In case you want to get the latest issue. 
but I don't think it matters. The eighth issue I want to have clearly understood and affirmed by any new elder in this church is, uh, is the issue of church discipline. What is church discipline? That means that we kick people out of church when they don't toe the line. That's as simple as it means. Now, church discipline up here would be to pure out the le- to clean out the leaven. So while we've got the non-Calvinists are over here saying, "Oh, shouldn't we let the tares and the wheat grow together?" The Calvinists are using this. They are weaponizing this kind of stuff to kick people out who do not go along with the nine marks migration. So while you're over here saying big umbrella, big umbrella, there's room enough for everybody. Once they have enough numbers, they are not big umbrella. They will kick you the heck out faster than, you know, you're gone. You're done. They're, they're on the march. They are migrating that church to a county. You, what are you migrating it to? You see? You don't have an agenda, do you? They do. They have an agenda, and when they're done with their agenda, you are out. So your big umbrella mentality is is fostering what's destroying the churches. It's, it's because of you. It's because of you that they're doing that. We can't have a big umbrella mentality. We just can't do it. So Jesus said, and the Lord... Uh, the Lord committed his unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Lost bartenders are wiser about handling clientele and handling it correctly and early as they should, more so than church leadership is. And we can learn a lesson from them. We need to grow it. We need to get some of that wisdom, get a double portion of that spirit and apply it to our assemblies. Hope you enjoyed this video. uh, Thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.